the clock was striking zero, I just kept looking up, and I'm looking up, and I'm like, we're about to win the Super Bowl. Everything that I've been through, I am on the biggest stage. I am about to win the Super Bowl. It was the pinnacle of his NFL career. But raising the Lombardi Trophy meant much more to James Jones than being a Super Bowl champion. It represented a lifelong journey, a journey for a man who once was a kid without a home. This is the story of James DeAndre Jones. When you're addicted to something, if you don't have the right help, you are you ain't gonna beat it. I mean, and all of us are addicted to something. For my mom and my dad, it was drugs. From birth through his early teens, James and his mother, Janet, did not have a place to call home. I was homeless for 15 years. It was, it was hard through the whole struggle, really, to tell you the truth. In and out of homeless shelters, in and out of motels. Uh, I was homeless for 15 years, it was rough. But it was just hard that, you know, I had to put him through that. So I remember sleeping in tents. I remember sleeping on benches. You have 90 days to live there for your parents to find a job. Number one, when you 90 days is up, you know where you're going, back to the streets. Man, I mean, me and my mom, we was motel to motel. I mean, some nights I sleep on park benches. I mean, that, I mean, that was the hard times. That's when you really was out there. I'm sorry life wasn't easier for him. He deserved it to be easier. A lot of moments I wanted to give up, but I looked at my kids and I couldn't give up, you know? So they, they kept me strong. This right here is a uh, 7-Eleven, man, that me and my mother used to stand in front of and I used to ask for money right along with her, man. I would stand on either side of the window, man. So I would either stand right here on this side, man, right here. I catch you when you go. I catch you when you walk in, and I catch you when you get out, man. Just asking for money, man. And I just plead, man. Like this guy coming up, man. I'll be like, hey, man. You know, me and my mom homeless, man. You know, anything to help, man. A dollar, man. Fifty cents, man. Anything, man. We just trying to get something to eat, man. It's crazy, man. It's crazy just coming back here knowing that I was. I used to be one of the kids standing right here asking for money. He figured this is the way I can help my mom. I feel sad sometimes because he had to do that, but it only makes us stronger. With no money and nowhere to sleep, James and his mother found a roof where they could. We had a sign as big as day that used to be in the front that said Los Plumas Homeless Shelter. It was here where Coach Marion Lorea came into James's life. This is actually how I got discovered playing football by my Pop Warner coach. Lorea paid for James's Pop Warner fees, but the two formed a bond that went far beyond money or football. I do consider him my son, and I speak of him as my son. And, and uh, when people get on Facebook to look him up or on the uh, internet to look him up, they come back to me with this look in their eye like, hmm, he doesn't look like a Lorea, but I do consider him my son. Coach Marion is like a father figure to me, man. He, he taught me a lot, not only about football, but about being a man. James found comfort in football. He also believed it would be his ticket out, a way out of a life full of constant struggle, fear, and despair. all know when you live in a homeless shelter it's a bunch of different people that live there man whether it's guys that have been out of prison whether it's guys that are on drugs whether it's men that you don't know really what they did and you're in the shower with them seven years old you seeing guys they got tattoos on their face and I mean sometimes the only shower that was available was a shower in between the dudes 
You know what I mean? So you come in here seven, eight years old, you way down here, they way up there. And I ain't necessarily saying somebody's gonna rape me or something, but even put their hands on me, anything, you never know. I mean, it, it was scary. And this was the room. What do you remember about this room? I mean, as I come back in here, I look at this, and I mean, I really can't believe I lived in here, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. To know that you lived in this, I mean, dang, look, you got one window. I mean, you take that window out, it's dang near just like you in a jail cell. To be honest with you, as a little kid, I prayed so much in here. That's one thing I remember. I would just sit on that top bunk, man, and pray, and pray, and pray, man. Didn't even know what I was praying about, but I was just praying to, to get us out of here, man. At what age did you realize this is not how normal kids live. I'm homeless. Mm, when it really hit me was probably, probably fifth grade-ish, you know, about to be on my way to middle school, because that's when you, when you start really like making friends, and then your friends ask, hey, come to my house, or can I come to your house? And then you're like, nah, you're not really not allowed to come to my house. And then you start realizing like, you know, I'm not living like these other kids. I'm here, if I woke up in the middle of the night and I was hungry or thirsty, you couldn't walk to the kitchen. So you just had to basically be hungry until the morning or till whenever you got food. Were there nights where you did cry yourself to sleep? I never would cry in front of my mom. Now, walking to the bus stop, I would cry. Coming home from school and walking back to this place, I would cry. I go to practice, I'll see kids' parents pick them up from practice and. You know, I'm on the bus with my shoulder pads. You know what I mean? At, at the age of at the age of nine, ten years old, I'm I'm riding the bus home with my shoulder pad. But I never cried in front of my mom. I never wanted her to think like it was her fault. Going through the situation is always hard. You know, because you you want to ask those questions, why me, and you know how I get into this stuff. Not too many dreams come true out of this room, to be honest with you. So how did you get? out of this room and to where you are now? I just had a dream, man. I had a dream that I was gonna go to the NFL and I told my mom that I'm gonna make it to the NFL and I'm gonna buy you a home. Everything I did, I did to make it to the NFL and to make sure I could buy my mom a house. And every time I left this room, even though it was times where I'm like, man, I can go hustle. You know, he can give me this to go sell and I can make some money. I always thought of my mom. I always thought of how she was addicted to the drugs and how if I would have got involved in any drugs and how that would have crushed her. And every time she would pop in my head and I would go the other way. As James's teenage years started, his situation went from bad to worse. It was really bad. It was it was really bad to the point where to the point where we were barely I mean, it will be one o'clock in the morning and we finally scrounged up all the money to get a hotel. After 15 years of living day to day with uncertainty, James did what he never thought he would do. He left his mother's side in search for some stability. Like mom, I can't do it no more. And she, she, that's when she told me she was like, "All right, I want you to move with your grandma. I want you to, I'm gonna try to get clean." I moved into this house. The situation with your grandmother, I mean, I know it brought some stability into your life, but at the same time, I understand that there were so many people living in like a three-bedroom house. Ooh. It was one time at my grandma's house. She had a three-bedroom home, and it was probably. It was roughly around 19 people living in there. It was it was hectic in there, man. It was, still was at times where no food, no lights, you know. And I mean, it, it was rough at my grandma's house. Still, I mean, I still had stability, but you know, my grandma was struggling too. Despite living in a crowded home, James finally had some normalcy in his life. He spent all four years at Gunderson High School. This is like too surreal right now, man. This feel like I was just walking out of classroom yesterday, man. And now I'm back here 
All the kids know me, want autographs, it's crazy. Growing up in homeless shelters and that instability, did that set you back a little bit when it came to school and your education? Were you behind the eight ball a little bit? Um, it did a little bit. Um, I had a couple, I had a couple classes, you know, that weren't in special ed, but I had a couple that were, so. I think the toughest thing about being in special ed, I think, is if you're not like strong-minded or if you're not mentally yeah. tough, you can let it bother you. Given his circumstances, being mentally tough was a given for James. He never allowed special education to label him. Instead, he quickly became a star athlete on the Gunderson campus, excelling in track, basketball, and of course, football. He's such a natural athlete in everything he does. He's just, he's so good at everything he does. Um, it, it was really easy to coach him because he's really coachable and he wants to work out. He wants to be in the weight room. He wants to do a lot of stuff. I used to come through here when I was about nine years old. Boom, 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 boom. I was a little Pop Warner kid, run on the field, run through a little tape. I can almost remember every touchdown that I scored on this field. But in high school, you know, I played quarterback some, I played receiver some. Just like all my life, people was doubting me and just everybody was like, James is not going to be good at quarterback. He's a receiver. He can't throw. All you're going to do is run and all that stuff. And I came out here the very first play, and I threw a touchdown. James had a lot of success on the football field, but red flags were raised for several colleges due to his academic standing. I had so many other scholarships to different schools, but everybody said he's dumb. Um, he's not going to pass the SAT. Uh, so we're not going to be able to offer him a scholarship. Uh, he can't learn a playbook. He's not fast enough. But Jones caught the attention of the coaching staff just a few miles down the road, San Jose State. To be honest with you, when I came to college, I was sorry. When I went there, man, I met my receiver coach, Keith Williams. He got a couple calls from my teachers and they're like, James hasn't been to class. Uh, he's going to be eligible for the football season. <laughs> he sat me down in his office and he said, would you do it for a million? Would you go to class for a million dollars? I'm like, who wouldn't go to class for a million dollars? I go to class every day sitting there for 24 hours for a million dollars. And he was like, well, that's what you're giving up. He said, if you don't go to class, he said, you're losing out on millions of dollars. Because if you don't go to class, you're not able to play football, and you're not able to make millions. And you got the ability, you got a chance to make millions of dollars. If it wasn't for him, I don't think I would have graduated, and I don't think I would have had a shot in the NFL. In his senior year at San Jose State, James had a breakthrough campaign. He's got Jones out there. reeling in 10 touchdowns in nearly 900 yards. However, his future as a pro was still in doubt. While he was rated the 133rd receiver in the country, a last minute invite to the NFL Combine would change things. I get invited to the Combine the day before. My agent calls me, he says, I have a sweat tool for you. Meet me at the airport. I had a real good weekend at the Combine. I left the Combine. I moved up from 133 to, to 64. Um, after my pro day, I moved up to 32. And then I had a couple workouts, and after my workouts, I moved up to 16. So I never knew like if I was going to get drafted or where I was going to go. On April 28, 2007, James received the phone call that would change his life forever. My phone rang. It was a 920 area code. And I'm looking at the phone like, I don't know nobody from Wisconsin. <laughs> so I answered the phone. Coach Mike McCarthy said, is this James? I'm like, yeah, this is James. Who is this? He's like, this is Mike McCarthy, head coach for the Green Bay Packers. We're going to take you with this next pick. And I'm like, man, stop playing, man. Who is this? <laughs> and me knowing Mike now, he said it with that deep voice, like, is this James? And I'm like, oh, man, this is real. He was like, this is Coach Mike. We're taking you with this next pick. And I don't even remember anything he ever said, man. I just started crying. My mom was there. She started crying. 
And it was, it was, it was crazy just because, like I always say, when you set out to do something and you work extremely hard for something and it finally comes true, there's no better feeling than that. And, and that's it's exactly what it was. I worked so hard. I told my mom at the age of three, I'm gonna make it to the NFL. I gave my mom a big old hug. We probably hugged for like 10 minutes. I remember the hug till this day. And I just told her we did it. I just told her we did it. And I, I just told her you don't ever have to worry about anything again. We made it. By this time, Janet Jones beat her addiction and was completely drug free. So James delivered the promise he made to his mother when he was three years old. I mean, we got out the car and uh, we walked up to the door and I, I gave her the keys and I said, Mom, this is your new home. <sighs> that moment is indescribable. It was, it was a surprise and I, it was just so, I was like, wow, I own my own home now. And all I could say was, is it mine? Really? And he's like, yeah. It's yours. I opened it with my key, and it was mine. And that was the happiest day of my life, one of them. I respect my mom so much, man. That's why I do everything I do for her, because I've seen how hard she worked every day to get up to make sure we had a roof over our head. I don't forget where I came from, you know what I'm saying? So, but when I pull up there every day, I, be, I look at it and I'm just like, this is mine. James never forgot where he came from either, even as the biggest moment of his professional career was on the horizon. We're about to win the Super Bowl. Everything that I've been through, I am on the biggest stage. It is 80 million people watching <laughs> the Super Bowl, and I am about to win the Super Bowl. A kid that grew up homeless, Coach paid for him to play football, in and out of motels, didn't eat some nights, you know, from homeless shelter to homeless shelter, riding a bus at eight years old by yourself, going to school. I'm about to win the Super Bowl, man. And it was just, it was just a surreal moment when I seen the confetti coming down. I just, I dropped to my knee. I just started bawling, crying. Think about the journey that I've been through to get here. That's what made me cry. To see all of the hard work, sweat, blood, and tears, the sacrifice um, just come to fruition and him actually like get to that stage, not only make it to the Super Bowl, but to win. You know, from a kid that grew up homeless, that's an unbelievable feeling. James wanted to share that feeling with those he owed the most. After Green Bay's Super Bowl win, James repaid his first football coach with a priceless gift. He gave me his jersey. I still, <laughs> I still get emotional about, I mean really emotional, um, to give me, that's a prized possession for a player to win the Super Bowl. And uh, we had a party at the restaurant. He told me, coach, make sure you're there. And when he gave me the jersey, I got emotional. I still get emotional when I talk about it. To me, that was a, uh, a wonderful thing. And it, it just makes me feel that he appreciated our relationship as we went through the years. Um, but I, th I thought, I have not got a better gift in my life. than that. I think that was just a wonderful moment. Still touching, I still get, <laughs> still get emotional when I talk about it. He thought I had a shot, and uh, he believed in me, and uh, I told him he's the one who started it all, and um, you know, the one who gave me the opportunity to even pursue my dream, and uh, I owed it all to him, so I gave him my jersey. To see him in the garage and not being able to help him, or I don't even know what to do to help him, you know what I mean? I try to tell him, okay, let's go to rehab, but you know, he denies it, saying he's not on, on nothing, but I know. What's the touchdown dance? Come on, y'all. Ready? One, two, three. Uh. Now 
30 years old, James appears to have it all. Still, he's not immune to life's problems. James's father is still struggling with drugs. He still lives with my grandma, He's still in the garage. And it's crazy because it's, I'm in a position where I can help him, but it's tough to help him. He's in my life, my, me and his relationship is, is great. As much as I want him to change and come out of that is something that he has to deal with on his own. I think it's gonna come around the corner. I think James loves how far they've come though. Yeah, he may want more, but they've come a long way. She worked in the one I stayed at over there. I'm the one that made him learn how to run fast. What's up, Batman? <laughs> yeah, all right? How you doing? Hey, Richard. Why are y'all laughing at Batman? What's the... <laughs> James continues to live by the words of his mother, Janet. Never forget where you came from. The Raiders Whiteout frequently makes surprise visits to homeless shelters to provide families with hope. But other than that, the most important thing is that you got out of there and look at where you yeah. are. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. That's the most important. You don't got to live in the same situation your whole life. You know, it, it can be done. And, I mean, private. When you see some of these kids, do you see a little bit of you in them? I do. Like I said, when you. I mean, when I was in the home, when I was in the homeless shelter, you had people come and donate. And the good thing is, is when I come back, I've been homeless, so I know how they're feeling. I know how the parents is feeling. I know how the kids are feeling. And you know, it ain't a good feeling. You know what I mean? When you know you're homeless, you do not have to be a victim of your circumstances. Fight, fight through all this, and good things will happen for you. Let me hug. Let me kiss. In 2008, James and his wife Tamika launched Love Jones for Kids Incorporated. Just like that, right there. Let's do it. The foundation helps communities and underprivileged youth in both the Green Bay and San Jose areas. We would give money out of our pocket to support the homeless shelter, and we sponsor feedings and barbecues there, um, and then extra clothes and clothes drives and things of that sort. Um, school drives with school supplies for the homeless kids. Um, we also do an annual football camp back at the high school, Gunderson High School, every year. I need a like strong cadence. Down! Set! Yeah, I need to hear it. Come on. Oh, man! Come on, down! There it is! Why do you share your story? I, I share my story just really to raise awareness. Whenever you think about homeless people, you never think about families and the kids. And I just want to let people know that Homelessness is serious. It is a lot of homeless families out there, a lot of homeless kids out there. Maybe you may go back and donate to a homeless shelter, or maybe you may, you know, see some kids on the corner at a 7-Eleven and he asks them for money and he's pleading for money, him and his mom, and you think about, man, this used to be James, or you know, this kid's homeless, and you help him. So for a kid who grew up without a home, James Jones is home, home with the Oakland Raiders. I'm hoping that, you know, I play these three years, get an extension and finish my career here with, a, with the Oakland Raiders. I would love to finish at home. I would love to help change, you know, my hometown team, be able to bring them a Super Bowl and even be able to bring them some winning seasons. It, it, it's gonna be unbelievable the way this city is gonna turn around. So I'm excited about the challenge. You got more than three years left in you? Definitely, definitely. I, if God keeps me healthy, I, I got a good five plus at a, at a high level. Once I start playing at a, you know, <laughs> at an old man level or, you know, I'm not as fast and my game is slipping, that's when I call it. I don't, I don't just want to play the game to steal years. I want to play the game at a high level and once I can't do that no more, I ain't the cleats up. <laughs>